very strong opposition to them. But in my experience, and I've encountered both views, the notion that somebody who was proposing to construct such a wind farm or to put up a turbine would be subject to physical threat mm -hmm. or even on the receiving end of a threat of commercial destabilization is almost incongruous to us. I can't imagine it. I'm thinking of my own constituency. I know on a number of occasions people have proposed wind farms and in a particular area there has been quite vociferous objection from people in the immediate mm -hmm. environment, although there may well be latent support for the idea because wind power is often thought to be part of a decent energy mix. But would those arguments crystallise into a potential physical mm -hmm. confrontation? Not in my experience, no. Absurd. Een zitting van het Britse laaghuis is vanmiddag geschorst vanwege een lekkage. De regen drupte door het dak, terwijl de parlementsleden bezig waren met een debat over belastingen. Een punt van orde zou willen cash. Ik wonder wat er going on. Is dit hot air that's escaping from in here? Uh, and somebody might say there's a leak in Parliament at the moment, so we'll take it from there, just in balance. <laughs> I'm sure many cabinet meetings have similar uh, difficulties, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I'm going to suspend the sitting, so the sitting is now suspended, and no photographs, please. <laughs> you leave the country for two minutes to come to our show, and everything is going down the drain. <laughs> well, I don't want to exaggerate the point, but we do have a real challenge, of course, of restoration and refurbishment of the Palace of Westminster as a magnificent construct. Mm -hmm. But it's an ancient building, and we are bedeviled with difficulties. But although you say I leave the country, Ava, and these problems arise, I left the country, but I left the chairing of the House in the very capable hands of the senior deputy speaker, Lindsay Hoyle, whom you saw there. Did he call you to tell you that it was leaking, the roof was leaking? I did receive a communication. <laughs> <laughs> and what was your answer office. to that communication? <laughs> My answer was to say, thank you for telling me, and I think that the right decision, <laughs> namely to adjourn the proceedings for the rest of the day, has been made. I've always preferred to be accused of hogging the chair than of being an absentee landlord. In other words, I'd rather people say, well, he's there too much than that he's there too little. I do tend to do more than my allotted share of hours, but I thought, well, I cannot possibly resist the opportunity to appear on your magnificent program. And so um, I left. This is by far the biggest compliment I've ever had in my lifetime. I'd only been gone an hour and a half from my This office. is what happens. And Jackie, who works with me, and I were at the airport, and we were just about to go to board the plane, and I got a call from my office to say, Mr. Speaker, the senior deputy speaker, on the advice of the clerk of the house, has adjourned the proceedings because it was really just not credible to continue the debate in the light of what was not a physical threat necessarily, but a very considerable interruption which needed to be checked and... Let's not consider it a metaphor for place. anything else. Let's just look at it as a practicality that will pass. And as you say, you like to hog the chair more than being uh, not there. Maybe you could fix the roof and everyone can watch you fixing the roof and they can be like, he's a really hands-on kind of speaker. Well, all I would say to that, Ava, is that my wife, Sally, would laugh uproariously at the idea that I could do anything so practical <laughs> as fix the roof. Very honest Sorting out you. a plug <laughs> is difficult enough for me. Now, there are experts who can do these things, but I'm afraid I'm not one of them. We'll leave it to the experts. <laughs> it was a spectacular news, so flak for the provinciale statenverkiezing. The cabinet made a draai and there would toch een CO2-heffing komen voor het bedrijfsleven. De fractievoorzitter van GroenLinks, Jesse Kaa. Koda! Do you do a warming up with your voice? <laughs> no, I've never had a warm up in any stretch. <laughs> the chair is. Ava, positively sotto voce, it is a it gentle is. It's a exhortation yes. not to make too much noise, not to keep answering back, just to accept the will of the chair. But the chair is gentle, restrained, yeah. understated. If that is thought to be shouting, goodness knows what she'll make when she sees or hears me at work. Shock. <laughs> Brexit tegenstander Steve verstoort nog altijd dagelijks de ochtendshow Good Morning Britain. Dus ook vanochtend mocht hij weer eventjes roep toeteren naar de camera. Steve Bray, isn't it? Yeah. Just say hi from us. 
Ramvi. He, he did. Do I have? Do I have to? Oh, no, you don't. You don't have to. It's just because we can hear it throughout, What's can't we? Yes, oh. I know. Oh. I might make a paper aeroplane and and send it to him or something with a note. Oh, I know. It's frustrating. Good morning. <laughs> He's just there no, on his own morning. this morning. If it could just he? be a little quiet occasionally, that'd be really nice. Just but during the broadcast. It's your right to do so. <laughs> we gaan nog even terug naar de rij, want Poon kwam iemand tegen die een hele eigen invulling geeft aan groen rijden. Ik hoorde dat groen rijden de toekomst had. Ik ben gelijk overgestapt. Dus je hebt nu, uh, ja, groen rijden is de toekomst, lege groen van binnen, welke kleur is het van buiten? Het is uh, gunmetal grey met uh, groen carbon, dat is een lichter uh, materiaal, gaat langer mee en duurzaam. Dat is toch helemaal hip met groen links, Jesse Klaver, Femke Hals, maar heerlijk. Ja, daar hebben wij een grafdief voor. Sorry, de vraag nog maar een keer. Ja, daar hebben wij hier een gezonde hekel aan op deze beurs. Gaat niet gebeuren. Er is nog een wereld te winnen, ja, zelfs het gaat om de promotie van groen rijden, denk ik, of niet? Uh, ja. Als premier Theresa May niet voor 12 april een oplossing vindt, zal ze om uitstel moeten vragen bij de Europese Unie. Het is de zoveelste bizarre stap in een chaotisch en langdurig proces. Niemand weet precies hoe deze brexit zo af gaat lopen, maar dichter bij het vuur kom je niet dan met een man die het lagerhuis dagelijks in het gereel moet houden. Mr. Speaker himself. May I congratulate you on your re-election? At least someone got a landslide. <laughs> If that word was used without equivocation or qualification, that word must be withdrawn at once. At once. Don't require any assistance from some junior minister. <laughs> We know what her name is. And it is inappropriate and frankly sexist to speak in those terms. There is an elaborate combination of finger wagging and head shaking going on. None of you is a traitor. Whether we say shriek or yell or bellow or shout, it was very noisy and it was disorderly. We have a cat called Order. We'll leave it there for now, and I hope there are no further points of order. There's an Arsenal match on television very soon. <laughs> It's a great pleasure and honor to have you. Down here, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. It's a thrill for us. Barry said it was a thrill as well. But considering how volatile the situation is back home, was it a wise decision to actually leave the country? <laughs> yeah. I don't think any harm has been done. There is no causal link between my leaving Westminster and coming to Amsterdam and the leak that took place in the House of Commons today. No link at all. Last night you cast the deciding vote. Let's have a look. You the eyes to the right, 310. The nose to the left, 310. Order, in accordance with precedent, and on the principle that important decisions should not be taken except by a majority, I cast my vote with the nose. Yeah. So the nose have it. The nose have it. By casting vote 311 to 310. That is the proper way in which to proceed. By casting this vote, a no-deal Brexit is off. How unique is it for you to vote along with members of Parliament? It's not unique in British parliamentary history. It was unique for me, mm -hmm. Ava, because it's the first time that there has been a requirement for the exercise by the chair of a casting vote since 1993. 93. And I know it may seem weird and almost spooky, but the last time that the Speaker of the House of Commons exercised a casting vote in 1993, it was in relation to a European Union matter. Speaker Boothroyd exercised a casting vote in opposition to, and therefore resulting in the defeat of, a Labour amendment to the Maastricht Treaty. It hasn't happened since then. There has never been a need for a casting vote. There's never been a tied vote. There's therefore never been an occasion on which I've had to make such a judgment. But making such a judgment isn't about taking sides philosophically. It's about making a judgment procedurally. In other words, so that your viewers follow my drift, mm -hmm. the challenge for the chair is to do the right thing in procedural terms and in essence the principle is that the speaker doesn't use his vote 
to make a final judgment on the issue under consideration. So, very simply, if it's what we call the second reading of a bill, mm -hmm. which is the first main debate on a piece of legislation, if it were tied, the Speaker would ordinarily vote aye, yes, so that the bill could go into committee. So it's not about your debate. political preference? But if it's the third reading, if it's the last stage and it's about to become law, the Speaker would vote no, because it's not for me to put on the statute book a new law. So it's not about my political preference, right. it's about procedural propriety. Now, does that mean that every single case without question is unarguable? No, there can be some grey areas, yeah, there can be course. areas of uncertainty and areas in which there is scope for difference of opinion between procedural advisers on the one hand and the Speaker on the other, and in the end the Speaker has to exercise his judgment. To be honest, to be explicit and not to mislead you in any way, yesterday was an open and shut case. I would otherwise have been creating a whole new day's debate in the hands of a We've particular had part of, of the House yes. without the authority of a majority vote. So it was pretty clear. This was an easy decision for you. It was. Being impartial in the House and just following procedures is part of the deal. Also, when, like in a situation like this, we're talking about Brexit or British politics, you have to stay impartial. I cannot ask you directly how you feel or what you had voted or what you expect well, to happen. Well, you can. And well, what I would happen? Well, I wouldn't tell you. You wouldn't tell me. Okay, I was prepared for that. The other thing is, we can't, I mean, we follow this. We follow it because it's a pleasure to watch, because it's exciting, it's thrilling. It's also driving us crazy. I don't think anyone here or anyone else in this, this world understands exactly where we stand. Is it possible for you as an insider to explain compactly, in layman's words, where we stand right now at this point in the Brexit crisis, drama, whatever you want to call it? Where we stand right now is that the United Kingdom remains in the European Union. Theresa May and the government want us to come out as soon as possible. The vast majority of Conservative MPs want to come out, but there is a difference of opinion about her policy thus far. The majority of her colleagues have supported her with the withdrawal agreement and the framework for future political cooperation mm -hmm. between the UK and the EU, but there's a substantial minority that don't regard it as a satisfactory or proper or clean Brexit, so they voted against. Mm -hmm. The Labour Party would say that it believes in honouring the referendum, but of course it is entitled as an opposition to say, well, let's look at the deal. Is it right? Will it work? Does mm -hmm. it safeguard incomes, citizens, the future strength of the economy, the quality of our environment? health and safety, and so on. So, where we are now is that there is deadlock or gridlock because the government wants to get a deal through and leave as soon as possible, but hasn't got a majority in Parliament. There are discussions between Theresa May and Jeremy Corbyn, and further propositions may be put to Parliament next week. We shall have to see. And I will have no say in what the result is, but the chair does have some responsibility for making procedural decisions mm -hmm. about what should be put to right. the vote and what should guiding the process. Barry, for you is this um, uh, this alles eigenlijk wat in Engeland speelt een reden geweest om jouw Britse nationaliteit na 57 jaar op te mm -hmm. geven en eindelijk Nederlander te worden. Mm -hmm. That is a grote beslissing. Yeah, that is an um, uh, yeah in, in 62 kwam ik naar Nederland, ik kreeg hier allemaal kansen om dingen te doen en uh, ik hou heel veel van Holland. Um, en er was nooit een, er was niet een noodzaak om te zeggen ik moet dit of ik moet een vergunning of dit en ineens de hele situatie met de EU, dat was uitstekend. En ineens Nigel Farah, die een aantal jaren geleden begon met zijn UKIP en 17 miljoen mensen in Engeland, besluiten dan om weg te gaan. Ja. Daar ontstaat dan in het land een enorme onrust. En um, toen begon ik mijn volk, waar ik vandaan kom, uh, heel anders te bekijken. De agressiviteit, de negativiteit, de gevoel van elkaar iets niet gunnen en, en onnodige ruzies en de smakeloosheid. En ik begon heel anders naar mijn eigen volk te kijken. En ik had iets van, wil ik daar überhaupt teruggaan daar naartoe? En uh, op een gegeven moment, mijn moeder is overleden, mijn vader. Ik heb geen broers of zusters of geen familie. En toen op een gegeven moment dacht ik bij mezelf... Ja, ik voel me hier happy. Waarom zou ik 
dan dat soort problemen mm -hmm. in het leven naar me toe eigenen. Um, en toen heb ik een, een beslissing gemaakt uh, vorig jaar. Het werd zo heftig in de, in de House of Commons en hoe dat, dat gevecht ja. en, en ongelooflijk dat dat gebeurt. En ik werd daar heel emotioneel van. En toen op een gegeven moment had ik iets van, ik ga hier iets aan doen. Want ik, ik wil eigenlijk hier niks mee te maken hebben. Je kan wel zeggen, ik weglopen, dat doe ik niet letterlijk. Je hebt een statement gemaakt natuurlijk, ook door een Nederlander te horen. Absoluut. Zeker na zo'n lange tijd, ja. Absoluut. The ironic thing maybe is that... Um, and to put it mildly, this has created a lot of problems for a lot of people, and it's taken a lot of energy and everything. The ironic thing is, it's made you a rock star around the world at the same time. <laughs> now, this is not something you were seeking out, or it's not the reason you do this job, but it happened to you. How does that feel? It's not something that I think about on a day-to-day -day basis, Ava, to be honest. Mm -hmm. I am the referee. I'm mm -hmm. the umpire. I am the person that facilitates the expression of the fullest range of opinions that exist in the House of Commons as possible. And my job is to keep order, mm -hmm. encourage people to take part, and try to cut down on the number of people who have to be excluded altogether as a result of bad behaviour. So you can see where the analogy kicks in with the referee of a football mm -hmm. match or the umpire of a football match Schiphol, this or a teacher. You landed at Schiphol this evening. People were yell yelling order <laughs> at you and asking you to take selfies. Yes. This must be a new experience. It is a new experience. I mean, I think that there are two factors involved here. One is of quite long standing, and that is that for 30 years, the House of Commons has been televised, mm -hmm. not just radio broadcast, but televised. So for decades, the Speaker has been a more visible and recognisable figure in British politics than was the case in the 1970s or the 60s or the 50s. So it's not entirely recent. For quite a long time, I've found that when I go out and about, a lot of people recognise me. And I always say, even I mean it most sincerely, I'm not important at all, other than I hope to my wife and three children. But the office of Speaker is important, mm -hmm. it's historic, and it's of continuing relevance, and it's very visible. But the second factor, as you rightly say, is Brexit. By a huge margin, the number of people watching parliamentary proceedings has risen. It has risen exponentially. It's crashed all previous records. And there is a great interest, not just in the United Kingdom, but across Europe. Because if ordinarily we're talking about British transport policy, or British environment policy, or British health service policy, it's of limited interest as yes. as across Europe. Not yes. no interest, but of limited interest. <laughs> but when we're debating something that is relevant, not just to us, mm -hmm. but to the European continent and to the relations between our forces, of course, there is yeah. a much wider interest in vote. So, this yeah, bit. I'm struck by it, but I don't sort of sit around thinking, oh, I'm well known. My job is to do my duty and make sure I'm there on time True. and that I'm properly awake and that I'm making selections of amendments and new clauses. But it's a deeply personal job on. and you could fill it in in different ways. So you're saying very humbly, I'm a referee, but the way you are as a person, the way you fulfill this job seems to be... Um, how can I say this properly in English? Colorful. You <laughs> mm. take the space that you, I mean, your personality takes the space that you use, and it's effective. It's an instrument, of course, but it's not like you're shying away from it. Basically, my question is, were you born a speaker? Were you, as, as a child, were you a speaker? Well, I've always been keen on speaking. In fact, my late father, who sadly has been dead for 32 years, used to say, John, generally speaking, is generally speaking. <laughs> so I've always enjoyed speaking. I've always loved communication. I've been horrified and almost paralyzed with fear at the idea of having to go on a dance floor. I cannot dance. I'm the worst uh, dancer in the history of my <laughs> city. So the idea of going in front of an audience <laughs> at a moment's notice and without a note and speaking is not something that carries any terrors from my point of view. So, no, I've always enjoyed speaking. I don't think anybody comes into Parliament, particularly in a Parliament of the United Kingdom, where the Speaker is obliged to be impartial and starts his or her career thinking, I want to be Speaker. I didn't. I was a Conservative MP, but eventually I gravitated towards it because I wasn't very good at tribal party politics. I wasn't very good at singing from a collective hymn sheet. I knew I'd be a lousy minister. I knew David Cameron wouldn't ask me to be a minister. I didn't want to be a minister. There was nothing left. And I thought, well, what am I going to do? Mr. I Speaker, and that's speaker. what you became. Well, you know, everybody is, in, in the Dutch Parliament, everybody is watching those those debates on, on the Brexit. And this is a, this whole Brexit 
process is without order. You know, it's one chaos. And when everybody's looking up to you, we get some sense of somebody is keeping order. <laughs> so I think this is one of the, the key factors why... Uh, what, structure. Uh, what, you give structure in, a, in, in this totally chaotic debate. Or two. Well... That something can be a vast miscellany of different views and those views conflict and people conflict. Yeah. But there have to be rules, there has to be a structure, mm. there has to be a process. We have to operate within some sort of framework, which to be honest, most of the time most colleagues accept. Do I enjoy it? Look, Eva, let me be honest, I'm not going to make out that this is some terrible burden to be borne. I wanted to be Speaker, I absolutely admit that I enjoy it. When in 2010 I was a about to be re-elected, I asked a very well-known Conservative who had served as Foreign Secretary to propose my re-election, Sir Malcolm Rifkind, and he said he was very happy to do so because he thought I'd made a good start. But he said to me, can I just offer you some thoughts? And I said, Malcolm, please do. He said, first of all, there are colleagues who feel that you wear rather garish ties. And I said, Malcolm, that's me. That's my personality. It's part of my DNA. I'm not compromising on that. And then he said, Secondly, John, I hope you will forgive me if I say this by way of counsel. And I thought, what's he going to say? And he said to me, well, many colleagues feel that, not to put too fine a point on it, you enjoy it all a bit too much. <laughs> and there's a slightly sort of British instinct that says that you're supposed to be bearing it mm -hmm. Can and I... not enjoying it. I love it. I you love it. Yes. Can I ask a question? Um, well, Eva's in this, charge. The, She's yeah, the of course she is. I know that. Well, no. But the separation between the English people at the moment, which is, is huge, it's tremendous. Do you ever get emotionally uh, in your own mind do you feel very emotional about this as as a, a, a full-blooded Englishman to see all this polarization between these people who are really getting at each other and the destructive sort of feeling they have to one another yes when there is must intense you. polarization I mean, very and irreconcilable yes. and sometimes very aggressive conflict yes. that upsets me. I mean, you say as a full-blooded Englishman, I'm really of European origin. Yes. My late father was of Romanian right. extraction. Okay. I'm of Jewish faith, right. Jewish background. On my father's side, my mother is a Yorkshire Methodist, so I suppose I'm a hybrid. I come from a number of different traditions. I wouldn't call myself a full-blooded Englishman, but I'm a patriot. I'm proud of my country. Yeah, I believe in my being. country. I'm committed to my country. Yeah. But above all, yeah, I'm a human being. Yeah. Do I like to see, you know, intense antagonism mm. and real personal hostility, venom, bile between people who are citizens of the same country? No, of course I don't like to see that. But there is a legitimate debate, and I completely respect your position and the conclusion you've reached. Mm -hmm. It has to be acknowledged that there are people of the opposite view who believe very profoundly in Brexit. They think right. it's in the country's interest. They're right. determined to see it to a conclusion. And within the chamber, I have to hold the ring. Right. I mustn't take sides. Right. I've got to facilitate. And I've got friends on both sides of the argument. I've got strong friends on the period. You have a wife. Side and you have a wife. Friends on the Brexit sure. side. You have a wife, sure. Sally. Yeah. And um, there's been um, a clash in the House of Commons about an anti-Brexit sticker in her car. Just a quick clip. Have a look. Mm. We've all noticed in recent months a sticker in your car making derogatory comments about Brexit. That sticker on the subject of Brexit happens to be affixed to or in the windscreen of my wife's car. <laughs> yes. And I'm sure the honourable gentleman wouldn't suggest for one moment <laughs> that a wife is somehow the property or chattel How's your marriage? <laughs> My marriage is in very good working order. <laughs> and I absolutely stand by that point. I mean, sometimes the argument is made about partiality mm -hmm. or the absence mm -hmm. of impartiality. And what is said is, oh, well, you, Mr. Speaker, are supposed to be impartial, but your wife is regularly professing political views, to which my answer is the obligation of impartiality, Ava, I don't want to be too heavy about this, but I believe it very strongly, applies to me. I'm the holder of the office, I draw the salary, I've been elected and have to be re-elected. That obligation doesn't apply to my wife. She's a private citizen, she's her own person, she's entitled to hold and articulate 
her view. She's always been absolutely upfront and open ever since we got engaged. We were, married. we were open about the fact that I was a member of the Conservative Party, she was a member of the Labour Party. Is she required to be silent? Or You're talking to a feminist, with so me. I would say absolutely, absolutely not. not. And if some people can't grasp it, it's about time they did grasp this it. This was very I'm clear. A I have to thank you. That was a great last word. Thank you so much for being here. Good luck with everything.